a little bit more orienting to some of what's available to you on the web page. Uh, I seem to have um, uh, brought you some R code and Maple code for doing one of the problems in problem set three. Problem three is about the scaled inverse chi-square distribution that we were just talking about as a prior and posterior in the Gaussian model where you know the mean somehow, but you don't know the variance. Um, and it's actually quite hard to work with the scaled inverse chi-square density when the um, quantities that are going into it are large, because uh, if you code it up naively, you end up having horrible underflow and overflow problems. So um, I've written some code down here and shared with you for how to avoid that difficulty. In R, for example, um, I wrote a density function for the scaled inverse chi-square distribution. Um, and the trick, of course, as usual, is to go on to the log scale first and exponentiate at the end. Otherwise, everything blows up. So, um, so if you want to work through that. I was glancing quickly through the uh, mid-course evaluations, and some, um, at least one person said, um, to make better use of the material in the problem sessions, we should perhaps have some time in here where I go through the problems and their solutions, uh, and everybody gets a chance to ask questions about the parts of the solutions they didn't understand. So if that turns out to be useful, um, I could spend some time on that uh, next time. Um, returning now to the, oh yes, there's a question. We do. We, ha we, 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 have to, we have to go downhill in order to flesh out the tails. But in the Gibbs sampling, yes. we always accept. So intuitively, we're not going downhill. Um, it, uh, it's hard to re-express the Gibbs sampler in the language of the Metropolis uphill and downhill moves. Uh, because the Gibbs sampler is a special case of Metropolis Hastings in which you always accept every move. Uh, and so, um, whereas, let me find one of those um, pictures where we were talking about things in terms of going uphill and downhill. So, here was our So, this was the sketch that we looked at to try to figure out what was going on with the Metropolis algorithm. Um, the Realistically, when you are metropolis sampling with a uh, normal proposal distribution with a modest standard deviation, which turns out to be the sort of value that you should to get optimal Monte Carlo efficiency out of this thing, you, you cannot realistically propose a move from here all the way to just, to just to the right of zero. And you cannot realistically propose a move from here all the way to way out in the right tail. They're just too far given the, the little window that's provided by that particular normal uh, proposal distribution. In contrast, the Gibbs sampler jumps around in such a way that, that um, you always accept every proposed move. And so it's as though the proposal, it's sort of like the proposal distribution were almost acting like the actual target distribution itself. And you just bounce around under that distribution. You can, you can go from anywhere to anywhere in the Gibbs sampler. Um, That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. So um, I wanted to mention, uh, before we go too much further, there's, some, there's definitely some useful stuff in today's handwritten notes. Um, a fair amount of it is redundant, given what I've been saying. But I'm going to flip through these and uh, then draw your attention to elements of today's handwritten notes, which were on the course webpage also, that are, that are particularly useful. Um, a reminder uh, about the way um, covariances and correlation coefficients work. Um, the generic data set for which a, um, the correlation coefficient was invented was a, a bivariate normal distribution where the, uh, the scatter plot looks like a, a series of ellipses uh, to uh, to capture the basic trend of the points. And so we have a data set with a column of y values and a column of x values. 
and the correlation coefficient is the covariance between those two columns divided by the square root of the product of the variances, where the covariance is defined to be the expectation of the product, how far x differs from its mean times how far y differs from its mean, and the correlation, sample correlation coefficient is then just the uh, sample version of that, co of that covariance idea divided by the sample version of each of those variances. So that's, um, that's the basic correlation idea. And then we want to apply that idea in the case of time series to uh, a situation where we grab one chunk of the time series and move it by one lag, one time period over, and line it up against the time series and then just run the correlation coefficient code to work out the autocorrelation. That's the first order autocorrelation of the time series, row one hat. And um, you can collect all these row k hats together for lag zero, lag one, lag two, and plot them. And the result will be something that people call the autocorrelation function. And when we get into wind bugs, I'll show you an example of one of these plots. Um, the correlation of anything with itself is always one, plus one. So if you correlate a time series with itself at lag zero, you get a correlation of one always. So these pictures always have a, a not very interesting spike of height one at lag zero. But what tends to happen with um, MCMC output is that the, you have a relatively high degree of positive autocorrelation at lag one. And then the, the autocorrelation decays because you're getting farther away in time from the, the observations you're talking about. And it tends to decay in, in what people call a geometric fashion. And it makes sense. What they mean by that is if the first order autocorrelation was about 0.9, then the next one behaves like 0.9 squared, and the next one like 0.9 cubed, and the next one like 0.9 to the fourth, and so on. So you get the shape for the autocorrelation function that looks sort of like a ski slope. And uh, the, the, uh, the slower the ski slope descends finally to the axis, the worse the mixing is. So basically, this picture is highly diagnostic of whether, whether your particular chain you're working with right now is mixing well or not. Um, it's, it's, it's a topic of research that I've worked on to see if there's a way to change the way you, you uh, construct proposal distributions in such a way that you can actually get the autocorrelation function to alternate between positive and negative values. And that would correspond to having the sampler alternate between sampling values that are above the, the middle of the, the distribution and below. And that would actually tend to induce a negative autocorrelation. And the result would be actually you, could, you can achieve faster learning about the parameters in this fashion than even with IID sampling. Because IID sampling corresponds to having, oh, by the way, the autocorrelation function of a white noise sampler would just be like this. It would have a spike of 1 at 0, and then all the other spikes would be trivially 0, because there aren't any autocorrelations. But you can actually, potentially, in theory, do even better than that by inducing negative autocorrelation. And that's something that, that I and other people have been thinking about. Um, so there are a number of things in here that I did cover, so they're already nicely um, uh, described. For an example of where you would want to bring in auxiliary variables, um, this is a, an example that you may or may not have heard before. Um, in physics, up until rather recently, uh, the physics community chose to regard the speed of light as something that was unknown and attempt to measure it. Um, and in fact, uh, Michelson and Morley, uh, scientists, I believe, working at the Naval Academy in Baltimore back in the late 1800s, were the first people to come up with uh, a reliable method of estimating the speed of light. Um, in recent times, f the, the physics community has decided to fix the speed of light in relation to some other quantity that, in turn, needs to be est estimated rather than the speed of light. So, so there's no controversy anymore about what the speed of light is, because they have just decided to define it to be some number. And then that translates the problem of estimation from the speed of light scale onto some other scale. And I forget what it is. But um, back in the day when they were still trying to estimate the speed of light, they got the following very embarrassing results. Um, starting from 1920 and going into the 1980s when, when they, or 1990s when they fixed the, the, um, the value, um, the current technology would give a value for the speed of light that was rather, let's say, in this particular decade, rather high and with an uncertainty band around it. And then they would come up with a new way that they thought was less biased for estimating the speed of light. And all of a sudden, it would jump to some value which was very different and such that, embarrassingly, the error bars between the two decades didn't even come close to touching each other. Um, so what the hell? You know, we, we, that's like saying we don't know what the speed of light is. And then they would go along, and then there'd be some other method that didn't, again, the error bars didn't overlap and, and so forth. So um, a model that can help to at least describe what's going on here 
is a model with what you call what people call random bias terms. And so we let um, y i j be the uh, j be the replication count for what's going on at time point i. So time is running this way, and we think of observation j at time i equal to the true speed of light plus a bias term, which we're going to regard as a random thing, because that's the only way we can possibly explain why these biases are jumping around so much. A random thing that's like a draw from a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance sigma squared b. Uh, those are called random effects. And then we add on an error term corresponding to measure, the ordinary measurement error for each individual um, replication. And the EIJs are also generally thought of as like draws from a normal curve centered at 0 with a different variant, sigma squared e, where this one was sigma squared b. Um, this model has a chance of at least describing what's going on here without fully embarrassing the physicist, because it basically says that each decade had a different way to measure the speed of light. Each of them had a different bias. We don't know what those biases are, so we'll model them in a Bayesian fashion like draws from distributions. Um, so the parameter vector here is, has three elements in it, c, sigma squared b, and sigma squared e. And yet, if you try to do the MCMC di just directly on those three, you'll find that you uh, have a lot of trouble getting a, a chain to mix very well. It turns out that, that treating these b sub i's that are unobservable as um, latent variables to be sampled along with the uh, parameters that you're interested in uh, fits into that framework I showed you before, first of all, where we have a bunch of auxiliary variables. It turns out that you can get much better MCMC output on the things you care about by sampling from these uh, random effects along with the other stuff. And in fact, what you would do typically is you would block update them all at once, and then you might do Gibbs sampling on, on the rest of it. And another thing about how, how uh, flexible um, this technique is that I haven't mentioned yet is that, um, in fact, uh, the, since every variant I've told you about is one version of metropolis hastings sampling or another, you can choose to do Gibbs sampling on some components of the parameter vector and metropolis hastings sampling on other, other components, single component metropolis hastings, and all manner of different combinations. It's, a, it's an incredibly flexible environment, and you get to pick whatever seems to be working, working best. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. You're, you're right that the, the noise level might itself also go down with time. You're right. And so it would be better to, have, to be able to put in sigma squared e as something that, that varies from time period to time period. And you could, uh, that, that's right. And you could do that here because you have replicates in each decade, so you do have a way of estimating separate variances. That's true. No, you're right. That would be a better model, probably. Um, so then there's some stuff you've seen already. Um, I do want to mention um, the absolutely worst thing. The, you know, uh, I'm telling you that MCMC is a good thing. But then, like I said in some other context, you ought to ask me what's the downside. Whenever somebody's trying to sell you something, they will automatically tell you about the good points. And you should always raise your hand and say, well, what are, what are, the, what are the bad points? Um, and here's the. Um, the worst thing from MCMC's point of view. Suppose the target distribution is multimodal. And in this example here, I've got a situation where 85% of the, of the posterior mass is over here in this big mode. And then well away from that other one, 15% of the mass is over here in this smaller mode. Um, this will not happen in the kind of models I'm showing you in the course, at least so far. Uh, it may be that later on, at the very end, we might come into models that have the possibility of multimodality. They come up a lot in, in uh, problems involving image analysis and spatial statistics. Anybody doing work like that, um, uh, you probably already know that you're working with likelihood surfaces that have multiple modes. There are models in that world where the likelihood surface looks like an egg carton, if you can imagine that. There's all these, all these little local modes. There's little local modes and local troughs, and local modes and local troughs. And so if that's what's really going on, Suppose you didn't know that, and you started off your MCMC sampler um, near the highest mode, and it was a metropolis sampler with a relatively small proposal distribution standard deviation. Then what's going to happen? You're going to run it for a lot of iterations. You might run it for 50,000 iterations or 500,000 iterations. And um, you, at the end of that, you will look at those iterations and say, wow, my chain seems to have been mixing OK. Um, and you'll say, I'm done. I've sampled correctly from the posterior. Whereas the problem is that your chain 
wasn't mixing well enough, it, it never made moves far enough to the right to discover the other mode. And so what you will do when you're done is you won't even know the other mode is there, and you will simply announce that the right answer is what you got from your draws over here. MCMC cannot do anything about this unless you work carefully to keep it from happening because it always just takes the answer at the end and renormalizes relative to what it saw. And if it didn't see this mode over here, it pretends it doesn't exist. So this is a bad, potentially bad thing about MCMC. It can, find, it can miss um, modes, sub, um, secondary and tertiary modes if they exist. And they're kind of, they're often, when they do exist, they're kind of interesting to learn about and figure out what's going on. Yes, that's right. So an uh, idea to beat that would be to start the chain at a whole bunch of different places and see if they all settle down to the same mode or not. And so one standard thing to do is to pick out a grid of starting values uh, indicated by these circles here and, and run a whole bunch of parallel chains. So this is a chance to do parallel computing in the MCMC world. By the way, just a single chain in MCMC is, is one of the least parallelizable things you can imagine. It's really hard to parallelize th this idea. Um, but if you're going to start at different, um, different uh, uh, initial values, then you could create a grid like this and start it at a whole bunch of different places and see if they all go to the same place, settle down to the same mode, for instance. However, that creates a problem, a circularity problem of its own, because how did you know how wide the scale should be in order to put down these grid points large enough, wide, widely spaced enough so that you could find the other modes? So there's a chicken and egg problem there again. This is a subject of active research. There are some ideas for advanced MCMC techniques that are that are, go beyond the scope of what I'm going to show you in this course. And it, it, it is possible to defeat this, but but without being careful about it, this is the Achilles heel for, for um, MCMC. Another thing to say is that people often talk about um, uh, thinning the chain, the Markov chain output. Uh, uh, essentially what they say is, well, I'm going to subsample the chain, I'm going to just write down out to disk every tenth observation rather than writing down every single one. So you might have made a monitoring run of link, uh, link 5,000 after a burn-in of 1,000. So you start at iteration 1,001 and you write things down in, um, all the way to 6,000. But someone else might have said, well, I'm not going to, have, I'm not going to write down all 5,000 numbers. I'll just write down 500 numbers that correspond to thinning the chain by a factor of 10 and only writing down every tenth observation. If you looked just at those 500 observations, would they have the same autocorrelation structure that all 5,000 observations do? No. Would they be more highly positively autocorrelated or less highly positively autocorrelated? Less, clearly. And so some people have, have falsely claimed that you can get better Monte Carlo accuracy by thinning than you can by working with the whole data. But that's stupid, obviously, because what you've just done is thrown a whole bunch of the data away. It looks to you like you have a better mixing, but it's a better mixing only on a smaller number of data points. You only have, you only have 500 points now. And yes, things appear to be mixing better for them, but you lose everything that you thought you gained by, by dropping the sample size by, by, by a factor of 10. So the only reason for ever thinning the output of, a, of an MCMC sampler is if your run has to be so long that it would fill up your disk with all of the, the MCMC data set would be so big that it would fill up your disk. And in that, those problems involving Bayesian nonparametrics, some of which I'll show you later, where I have needed uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 million draws, um, I have, um, that's where I've started to think about thinning. I've written out every hundredth, hundredth draw or every 500th draw or something like that just to keep the MCMC data set from getting too big on the disk. But that's the only reason for thinning. Uh, and anybody who tells you otherwise hasn't thought it through completely. Um, the other thing called extra notes, there's a few ideas in here to, to mention also, if I remember correctly. There's a little section, which I won't brief now, on sample size determination and inference. We'll come back to that later. That's a topic I'm going to have a whole little unit on. Um, and that might be, yeah, that might be just about it for the other section, at least for now. But there's a whole bunch of, of sketches in there that, that will uh, reinforce what we've been doing in the rest of what we're looking at. All right, so um, we're just about ready to go and actually code. Um, first, I need to say a few other things. There's a section here starting on page 43 giving a sketch of the proof of why the Metropolis algorithm works. For the mathier, uh, those of you in the audience who like to really pick things apart and figure out why things work, 
I think you'll find this pretty interesting. It goes on, it's, a, it's just a proof sketch, but it goes on for four or five pages and really shows what's at the heart of making this proof work. And you get to the, the moves you end up making in the proof um, here at the end on the last page. Um, they, they are of the form, the only way someone could have figured out that this was the right proof is to have pretended that the algorithm works to begin with and work backwards from that pretend. Uh, and, and so that's essentially how everyone has managed to prove this thing. You, you just pretend already you know it works because um, it does turn out to work when you, when you use it and then figure out what sort of steps you need to, to write down in order to make it work. You sort of you run the proof backwards rather than trying to run it forwards. Uh, another idea I'd like to share with you is a thing called directed acyclic graphs. Um, Windbugs in particular achieves its generality in fitting models by means of two basic ideas. One of them is by viewing Bayesian models as examples of a particular kind, kind of object in graph theory called directed acyclic graphs, or DAGs for short. Um, what's going on here is that the, um, there's an important nature involving conditional independence in, in Bayesian models uh, of a hierarchical nature. Uh, I, uh, I'll remind you now of that hierarchical way we wrote the t-distribution some time ago. It's on the bottom of page 38. Um, if you were fully building this model up hierarchically from, from the top of equation 23, you would have to write down the following things. You'd have to write down nu, then you'd have to write down sigma squared given nu, then you'd have to write down mu given sigma squared and nu, then you'd have to write down lambda i given nu and sigma squared and mu, and then you'd have to write down y i's given everything before. Because the only way you can build up a joint distribution across a whole bunch of things you don't know is by factorizing it in that way where you chain along and you're always conditioning on the stuff that, um, that you assumed before, right? So the right way to write that down and let me take a moment to, to express it here. I'm going to write a little. So here's what you'd have to do. I'll, now I know deliberately I'm doing this because I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. And I'll get to um, so a full statement of the entire hierarchical model here would have to look like the following. Come on. Um, you'd have a model from new, and then a model for sigma squared given nu, and then a model for mu given sigma squared and nu, and then a model for the lambda i's given all three of those things, and then finally a model for the y i's given the lambda i's and all the previous things that went before. But what starts to happen when you examine the, the structure of these models is that um, it's okay to make some simplifying assumptions along the way because you don't need some of the dependence links that you see here. For example, there's no reason in building the prior for sigma squared to condition it on what nu is necessarily. And so you can throw that link away. And if you, in the hierarchical um, representation of the conjugate prior for sigma squared and mu in the normal model, you don't need to know the degrees of freedom. You're just working with sigma squared, mu given sigma squared. So that one disappears also. And in fact, um, the way the, model, the T model works, if I offered you both nu and sigma squared and mu and ask you to simulate the lambdas, you don't need either that one or that one. And then finally, if I offered you all this stuff and asked you to simulate the y's, um, you don't need the nu. Um, and um, so what you see happening is that um, the actual structure of the model is, is much simpler than it would otherwise have been if everything, every single possible connection between the variables all had to be explored. The, certain things become conditionally independent of each other given the values of other things. And so that really simplifies what's going on. Um, and that fact can be expressed um, very nicely in, um, by using ideas from graph theory. So that's where this directed acyclic graph thing came about. So let's go talk about that again for a minute. Um, so the conditional independence nature of Bayesian hierarchical models, and all Bayesian models are hierarchical in, their, in the way they're built, and the idea is that quantities in the model depend on things one layer higher in the hierarchy often, but no higher than that. For example, in the thing I just showed you in the NB10T model, the yi's depend upon the, the elements that are closest to them in the graph, but they don't depend upon the, the element nu that is the farthest away. Anyway, the conditional independence nature of these things lends itself to thinking of all the quantities in a Bayesian model as what are called nodes or locations in a particular graph. And it's going to turn out to be a directed graph 
by which I mean that uh, the arrows going from one node to another correspond to the idea of uh, what you need to know in order to be able to simulate something. You look backwards and find what are the arrows that are coming to that object, and that tells you those are the things you need to know to be able to simulate. And so one of these DAGs can be thought of as a picture in which known and unknown quantities are represented either by squares for known things or circles for unknown things, and everything is connected by arrows that describe the nature of the stochastic dependence and the arrows in using language the, from the, the um, graph community, the arrows always go from the parent nodes to the children nodes. And so uh, that's, uh, this is going to be an example down here at the bottom of a sketch of uh, the directed acyclic graph for that NB10T model I showed you expressed in terms of that um, uh, inverse gamma mixture of normals. And the acyclic assumption is important. It means that by following the directions of the arrows, it's impossible to go in a circle. It's impossible to end up where you started again. Because if that can happen, then you really can't figure out what's going on in the graph, and you might as well give up and find a better model. So um, the last item is that uh, each, each, each um, thing in this sketch looks like a sheet of paper, and stacked sheets of paper just represent the replicates in your data set. So here we have sh and little n sheets of paper from little one, you know, from one to, to two down to little n. And the graph says as follows. Um, the capital, or rather the y sub i's are in squares because we know them. They're the observed data values. And that's actually in this model. Those are the only things we actually know. Everything else is unknown to us, and we're going to try to learn them. So um, there's an arrow from the new. First of all, the new and the mu and the sigma squared are all sitting outside the stack sheets of paper. That's because they don't have an index i on them. They sit above all of the repetitions in this graph. Um, second thing to notice is that there aren't any arrows from new to anything except the lambda sub i's, and that's because all you need to know to simulate the lambda sub i's is what the value of new is. And so that's already an example of um, a degree to which the graph is much simpler than it might otherwise have been. Now, in order to know how to simulate the y's, you need to know both the mu and the sigma squareds. And in order to know how to simulate the mu, you need to know the sigma squared in the way I wrote the prior hierarchically. So sigma squared is a driver or parent node um, with mu and the y sub i's as children in both directions. And then uh, having known the mu and the sigma squared and the lambda i, you can then finally simulate the y sub i. So that's the directed acyclic graph representation of the T model I showed you before. And believe it or not, there are some people in statistics who find it easier to specify a Bayesian model by drawing that diagram than they do by writing out the algebraic representation of it. And so it turns out that David Spiegelhalter is one of those people. And since he's the one who created WinBugs, um, he built into WinBugs a feature called DoodleBugs in which you can specify the model either through one of these graphs or by writing it down algebraically. I will not show you how to use DoodleBugs because I don't think about models in that graphical way quite so readily. So I'm going to show you algebraic representations of the models. And uh, those of you who think about them graphically can can, you can always press a button once you've, you've uh, built the model in WinBugs algebraically. You can press a button, and it will show you a doodle of what the, what the graph, what the DAG looks like. Um, yes, that's right. Um, that's exactly what's going on. That's right. Um, so I told you already about adaptive rejection sampling. I won't dwell on it too much. This is that idea that Wally Jokes had, along with, um, I think it was Jokes and, and Wild. Um, um, formally, when you have something that's a vector of length more than one, the, the log concave idea uh, comes down to asking whether the determinant of the Hessian matrix of uh, second partial derivatives of the logarithm of the function is, is um, uh, less than or equal to 0. Uh, that's just a um, multivariate way of talking about bull shape down. And the, um, uh, here's another picture showing what's going on uh, here on page um, 50, where we build an envelope. This is an envelope for something that's log concave that has three particular points. And, and by using the, um, the, the relevant um, uh, line segments, you can see how, the, how you would build that envelope. There's also this concept called squeezing functions that, that improves the uh, uh, the efficiency a little bit, but it's not that important. I won't focus on it too much. Um, now, how does WinBugs get its full conditionals? Well, um, first of all, it tries to verify conjugacy. 
And if things are conjugate, it has a lookup table. It actually can work out what the full conditionals are from a lookup table because there's only a finite set of, of full conditional updates in the standard Bayesian sampling distribution. So it has a, a, an extensive lookup table, and it solves the full conditional problem by lookup if, it's, if things are conjugate. If that fails, it then tries to verify log concavity of the full conditionals and uses adaptive rejection sampling, if so. And if that fails, it switches over to a version of metropolis hastings sampling using an idea called slice sampling, uh, which we don't really need to go into here. And it turns out that log concavity includes many but not all distributions that arise in standard models. Uh, for example, if I wrote a uniform prior on the degrees of freedom parameter in the NB10 model, um, which I will do presently, that turns out to fail log concavity, so they, they switch over seamlessly inside the box without you having to be worried about it to, uh, to um, um, slice sampling. There's an even older version of bugs called uh, win bugs. It's not called win because it wasn't Windows. Called classic bugs, that was distributed even before win bugs that worked on Unix machines. Um, and uh, you can that that story has been largely supplanted by the um, Jags program, which is available both in Windows environments and also in um, Mac OS X and also under Linux. And so basically. I just wanted to mention that there's, that there's this thing called classic bugs. And for anybody who ever wants to do it, I've shown you some examples of how to do it here. But um, I'm not going to dwell on it because it's, uh, it's old news. Um, OK, but now I'm about to fit the NB10 model to the, uh, the, the T model to the NB10 data. Um, and to do that, I have to think about what um, I should be putting in in the way of, of prior information external to the data set. Um, so as I mentioned to you before, um, I don't know much of anything about the true weight of NB10 a priori, especially down on the scale of micrograms below the nominal weight of 10 grams. So I would like to use a diffuse prior from you. And um, uh, one idea to create a diffuse prior is to use a normal distribution, but with a really, really, really big standard deviation. So suppose, as is going to turn out later on, that the likelihood function for mu is concentrated around a narrow region from about uh, 400 to about 410. That will turn out to be approximately right, maybe even narrower than that. Um, it might sound strange, but if I, and this is not drawn to scale, but if I drew as my prior a normal distribution centered at zero with a standard deviation of 1,000, then what would that look like? Globally speaking, it would be highly curvy, right? Because the normal curve is curvy over all of its range. But look, because the standard deviation is so big, in the little region there where the likelihood is appreciable, the, that normal distribution is actually not that far from being constant and actually flat. And that's because essentially what we're doing here is we're using a, a fact from Taylor's theorem that basically when you get up close enough to a function and you look at its local behavior, if the function is nicely behaved, all, all nicely behaved functions are locally linear. <laughs> uh, even though they're globally curvy, nonlinear, they're all locally linear if you look in narrow, narrow enough slices. And so uh, oddly enough, um, writing a prior down like the following form, mu is a draw from a normal distribution centered at 0 with a huge variance. That's actually a good way to create a diffuse prior on mu. But you, I think I mentioned to you already that, that many Bayesian people like to think about scale in the normal family, not in terms of variance, not in terms of standard deviation, but instead in terms of that concept called precision, which, if you may recall, is reciprocal of the variance. Um, and so huge variance corresponds to tiny precision. And in the Winbugs world, everything that has anything to do with the normal distribution in that world, anything that has uh, anything to do with a normal distribution has its scale measure specified in terms of precision. And so we find ourselves writing down things like 1.0 e minus 6 for the precision of this distribution. And so if you think that, about, think that through, it means that the variance is equal to a million. And therefore, the standard deviation of this distribution is 1,000. And saying that the prior is normal with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1,000 is like saying that, as far as we're concerned, 
the mu in, on the micrograms below 10 gram scale could be anywhere from about minus 3,000 to plus 3,000. And actually, in the region where the likelihood is appreciable, that's a relatively diffuse prior. It's pretty close to flat. So I'm going to use a statement like the one that I have back there on the, on the uh, organized notes. And um, in Windbug speak, um, you and also in, in uh, JAGS, because JAGS was written by this guy Martin Plummer uh, when he had a meeting with Spiegelhalter and realized that Spiegelhalter had no interest in porting WinBugs to any platform other than Windows, <laughs> Martin Plummer said, well, okay, I'll port it for you. And he, because um, WinBugs was already freeware anyway, and Spiegelhalter said, more power to you. He um, essentially rewrote WinBugs in, in a way that allowed him to distribute binaries for Mac OS X and Linux and even Windows. Um, and he liked to, to even have a Windows version of JAGS because, in fact, JAGS is, some, is meant to be some sort of extension of the, of the um, uh, WinBug syntax. I will tell you more about that next week. Between now and next Friday, I'm going to teach myself how to use JAGS so that I can help you guys who are Mac users in here. Uh, and I'm going to see what I think as well. Um, um, but in the WinBugs world, something like this that I'm highlighting here um, with the mouse, um, tilde is just like what we use when we write down on, on the page. Tilde means is distributed as. So the phrase mu tilde denorm is the bugs version, WinBugs version of, of saying mu is like a draw from a normal distribution, denorm is the normal density, is like a draw from a normal distribution with mean 0.0, .0 and precision 1.0 times 10 to the minus 6. So that's going to be how we'll specify that kind of prior information. Now, I would also like a diffuse prior for sigma squared because I don't know very much about um, the um, scale, the, the, the accuracy with which the NB10 people um, are doing their weighing either before seeing the data. And that's like saying I want a diffuse prior either for sigma squared or equivalently for its reciprocal, the precision. And as we saw in the Poisson length of stay case study, one popular conventional choice is to take the precision tau to be a draw from a gamma distribution with parameters epsilon and epsilon. That was what we called the gamma epsilon epsilon prior for a small value of epsilon like 0 0.001. And the way you would say that in bug speak is just like this. You'd say tau, the, the thing you're using for the precision, is distributed as a draw from a gamma with parameters 0.001 and 0.001. And this distribution is very close to flat, as we saw in one in earlier session, I guess it was last week, over an extremely wide range of the interval from 0 to infinity, although, as we saw, it does have a nasty spike at 0. As tau gets close to 0, the, the gamma epsilon epsilon prior goes to plus infinity. But as we've seen several times, the idea behind diffuse priors is to make them approximately constant in the region in which the likelihood is appreciable. And so we have to figure out where the likelihood is appreciable. Um, and um, for that purpose, it's useful actually to remember what the frequentist answers for mu and sigma would have been if we had been fitting a Gaussian model. Earlier, we found that the 95% confidence interval for mu came out from around 403 to 406. And by regarding that as roughly two standard errors either way, and instead substituting in three standard errors either way to correspond to the empirical rule saying that almost all of the mass should be within three standard deviations either way, then you should think that the like is appreciable from somewhere around 402 to 407. And that, in fact, is a little narrower than what I said a minute ago from 400 to 410, but you get the basic idea. I can actually use um, frequentist logic to work out the corresponding interval approximately for sigma or sigma squared or even tau. Um, you may recall uh, there's a standard result from frequentist distribution theory that in repeated sampling from the Gaussian model, n minus 1 times the sample variance over sigma squared behaves like a chi-square draw with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, where s squared is the usual so-called unbiased estimate of the variance. And we're in the frequentist world, we're regarding s squared as random and sigma squared as fixed. And that being the case, you can write down a, a frequentist probability statement uh, like equation 44 that says you can find some numbers A and B that come from the chi-square distribution having the property that the frequentist probability that the ratio n minus 1 s squared over sigma squared lands between A and B in repeated sampling is some big number like 0.99. And you can do that by finding, by taking the remaining mass, which is 0.01 and dividing it in half and putting 0.005 in the left tail and 0.005 in the right tail. 
And then um, using a, a version of Mr. Neyman's confidence trick, I can take equation 44 and rewrite it by just flipping the inequalities to make it look like a probability statement about sigma squared, in which, strictly speaking, from the frequentist point of view, sigma squared is a fixed known number, but the, the s squared uh, on the left or the right of the sigma squared is, a, is the thing that's random. And now Mr. Neyman would say, therefore, I'm going to use n minus 1 s squared over b up to n minus 1 s squared over a as my 99% confidence interval for sigma squared. So it turns out with the NB10 data, n is 100. There are the number, 100 numbers in the NB10 data set. And s squared came out about 42. And you can use r to do this little analysis for us. So I print n as the length of y, namely 100. And I um, calculate the variance of y and stick it in an object called s2 and print that around 42. I asked the uh, chi-square technology, uh, where is the quantile that corresponds to only 0.005 in the left tail? That's about 66. I asked, where's the place with about 0.005 in the right tail? That's about 139. And I calculate those endpoints that Mr. Um, uh, that Mr. Um, uh, uh, Neyman had in mind, namely n minus 1 s squared over the larger of those two uh, quantiles from the chi-square. And so the lower limit of the interval is about 29.8. And n minus 1 s squared over the upper one, uh, oh, I mean over the, the um, uh, smaller of those two uh, inter, uh, quantiles comes out about 62. Um, now I can, uh, in effect, um, uh, take that expression and see what it implies about that was a confidence interval for sigma squared. So the reciprocals of each of those things should be confidence intervals for 1 over sigma squared. So I take the reciprocals of each of those numbers, and I discovered that the likelihood for tau, which is 1 over sigma squared, should be non-negligible roughly in the region from about 0.015 to 0.035. So I've used frequentist ideas to get where the likelihood is, supposed to, is, 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 is probably going to be negligible. And now I can plot the prior distributions in each case and see whether I do achieve approximate uh, constancy in the region where things are appreciable. So actually, my sketch a little while ago made it look as though the um, normal distribution might not be quite as flat as it is. Here at the top of page 50, whatever it is, 56, I plotted on the left the global view of that normal prior, mu, namely, for mu, namely um, normal centered at zero and with a standard deviation of 1,000. But then I look at the local view of that same exact curve in the region from 402 to 407, where the likelihood is appreciable. And look, it's an absolutely dead constant in that region. So that's basically Taylor's theorem um, down there at the level of, of looking at this globally curvy nonlinear function being essentially completely linear and, in fact, essentially completely flat in the narrow region in which I'm interested. Then at, for the tau, the um, gamma epsilon epsilon prior, you can see on the left-hand side, globally from 0 all the way out to 2, um, has that big spike near 0, and then it's flat everywhere else. But if I look at it locally in the region where the likelihood is appreciable from about 0.015 to about 0.04, you can see that it actually is pretty close to constant. It has a little bit of a curvature that will shift things a little bit back towards small values, but not very much. Now, what about the prior for the degrees of freedom? Um, we know from that normal quantile plot earlier that the data are far from normal. So does that suggest putting a prior on nu that's concentrated mainly on small degrees of freedom or medium degrees of freedom or large degrees of freedom? I know the data is far from normal because it had big old outliers in both tails. Do you get that from a t distribution with small, medium, or large degrees of freedom? Small. Now, I personally. Um, don't find it sensible to let the degrees of freedom in the T family fall below 2, because the variance of anything drawn from a T distribution with degrees of freedom less than 2, the variance is infinite. And um, whatever you can say about your work um, using probability and statistics to learn about the world, you will never encounter a real world situation in which anything has infinite variance. It's not possible. So myself, I prefer to work with priors on degrees of freedom parameters that start at 2. And now the question becomes, how can I be diffuse? I don't know what it, the, the right answer is um, for the degrees of freedom, except that it's somewhere in the small range. So I want it to run from 2 to something. And saying I don't know much about it means I'd like to put a uniform prior down. 
And so what's the principle here? Um, I always want to try to put down um, a uh, prior that does not artificially truncate the likelihood function. So now I'm thinking about the degrees of freedom parameter. And the degrees of freedom parameter has to live in, I insist it lives to the, to the right of 2. And whatever the likelihood function looks like, maybe it looks something like this. It's going to have some kind of long right-hand tail sort of thing. This is going to be the likelihood function for new given the data. Um, I want to make sure if I'm going to put a uniform prior down from 2 to something, I want to make sure it's far enough out that it doesn't chop off the likelihood function, because that would be artificially truncating what the data has to say. And by a little bit of experimentation in this problem, I chose the value 12. Now, what would have happened if I had picked a value like 5 instead, or 6? Um, I guess no, halfway between 2 and 12 is 7, so let me talk about 7. If I would chosen a prior that was uniform from 2 to 7, what would the posterior have looked like if that was the likelihood function? It would have gone just like this, like it should have, except when it got to 7, what would happen? It would have st stopped abruptly and been truncated. And so that's a way to show myself in a preliminary run with wind bugs that 7 is a, wrong va is a, is a bad value for this prior that runs from unif uniform from 2 to the number C. C is a bad value for that. Uh, um, C equals 7 is a bad value for that because it artificially truncates the Likert function. So I just run a couple more times until I move the C out there big enough that it's no longer truncating the likelihood function, and I stop. This is not an illegal use of the data twice, because all I'm doing is trying to make sure that the uniform prior does not do something that it, I don't want it to do, namely trun artificially truncate the likelihood function. I'm not inserting information through this prior. I'm trying to technically pick a value for the upper limit of the uniform that does the right thing and gives full honor to the likelihood function. So. It's, it's some kind of gentle use of the data, but not for the purpose of, of actually learning about the parameter from the data. Instead, just making the mechanism by which we learn about the parameter actually function correctly. So that's my prior. And now I'm ready to show you um, the results in WinBugs. So let's get in there. Let's see, 245 to 345. And it's now good. We can work for 10 more minutes and then come back after the break, and that will be how we finish it. So um, if, you, if you have a Windows machine, the way you get WinBugs is you just go in, to, in at your favorite browser, um, which by a laughter a few weeks ago, all of you demonstrated to me, must be Google, of course, in this, in this room anyway. And you type in WinBugs. And right away, you go directly to the Bugs project. And there should be a button for downloads, right? So down here it says something about download and install it, right? So it's pretty easy to get. Um, you do need to uh, install a patch to upgrade it to the very latest version, which is easy to do. And you do need to um, run a thing called a key, which makes WinBugs what they call immortal, meaning that uh, in the early days of WinBugs, they were funded by the analog of the British analog of the National Science Foundation. Um, and so they wanted to show the British government that the money that they were given to create WinBugs was well spent, taxpayer money well spent. So they forced everybody in the old days to register. As part of getting the freeware, you had to register with your name and email address so that they could show to the UK government that there were all these people who were using WinBugs. But they don't need to do that anymore because they're not getting funded anymore. And so after a while, they just said, oh, forget that. And so now, basically, um, you don't have to register anymore, but you do have to get this thing called the key that makes your copy of WinBugs immortal so that it never never expires because you didn't have the right key. So there's two things you have to, to download and, uh, and that act like patches, but it's easy to install them. And when you're done, you have an icon on your desktop that looks like this, and you double left click on it, and there you go. The first thing you always get from WinBugs is some lawyerese that talks about um, uh, basically, you know, you, here's an agreement between you, the licensee, and uh, uh, various places that, that actually funded this, the, the licensor. And essentially what they're doing is they're basically saying, um, we cannot be held responsible for any bad science that came out of you using this, this program. And the reason that we cannot be held responsible for that is one of these caveat emptor sort of things. They are basically saying in this legal document, we remind you that what you're getting out of this is exactly equal to what you paid for it, 
and what you paid for it is zero dollars. The current fee is zero dollars, and so basically their legalese says, don't sue us because you paid nothing for it. That means that we didn't guarantee you any value from this product. So uh, right away, the first thing you always do is to kill off the license agreement, obviously. <laughs> um, um, no, 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 you just, you just don't even read the damn thing, okay? Um, now, a quick way to get the files from the web page for this course is you go up into the file menu and you choose new and get a little window like that. Then you go back to the course web page and you go down and grab this text file and you copy it and go back into WinBugs and paste it into this new file here. And the result for my poor, tired, old, middle-aged eyes is that it comes out in a font that's too small. And so I always go ahead and highlight it and go up to attributes and set it up, bring it up from 8-point to 12-point font. I think that's better, don't you? So that's going to be my model file. Then I'm going to go back. I'm going to start a new. Uh, it's going to turn out that you, you need three files in WinBugs. You need to tell it what your model is. You need to tell it what the data is. And you need to tell it where you're going to initialize the markup chain. So I create three of these little windows. And I go back to the web page each time and grab the data file. And I'll explain the syntax of each of these things in a minute. But I just grab the data file, stick it in here, and make it bigger each time. There's probably some button I could push to force the default to be 12-point font, but I never bothered to learn it. And then I'll get the initial values as well. So there's my final new file. I go back here and grab nb10 init's1. And it's a tiny little file. And that's deliberate. They tried to write WinBugs to make it so that if you're used to writing in R, then you're going to be happy writing in WinBugs. And then in turn, Martin Plummer chose the syntax of JAGS to look just like the syntax of WinBugs. So everybody's following everybody else around, and that's no bad thing, because you just have to learn R, and then you, you're kind of comfortable in all three environments. Um, and R is based on S, and so if you uh, all these decades ago learned to write in S, then you're golden with that too. So here's my three files. Um, typically, if I wanted to run this again, um, I would now save these guys to some place and then load them later on using the, uh, in the, on the file command. You can, um, you can choose open instead and load them that way. Um, and they get loaded in, they get saved in, in a strange internal format that only WinBugs understands. Uh, but, but here I'm just going to show you how to, how to work with these files. So let's talk about the data first. Um, the, um, uh, list environment is one way to uh, structure a data set in R. Uh, and in fact, there's even a command in R called dput, which will output from R a data set that's exactly in this list format. And so I say, if I were constructing the data set by myself, I say list, open parenthesis, then I name the vector of interest, and I say y equals, and I use the collect operator in, in R, c, open parenthesis, and then I just type in all the data values separated by commas, and at the end here, I also have to tell it that the sample size is 100. So I say y equals blah, 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 comma, n equals 100, and I finish the list environment. If you were to have this variable in R already, um, then you could use dput to dump it out. And that would give you all this part that goes list y equals blah, blah, blah. And then you'd have to edit it a little bit and put in the n equals 100 yourself. So that's the basic data structure in R for simple data sets like this one, which are univariate um, with um, no predictor variables. Then over here in the model file, um, in turn, in the same way that there are three files to pay attention to, um, I like to think of each of my model files as consisting of three parts. There's the specification of the prior distribution up here at the top. There's the specification of the sampling distribution in the middle, which defines the likelihood function. And then there's a little area down here in which I can define any other quantities that are derived from, related to the quantities that are actually nodes in the graph. Um, and the way I actually write these, these uh, model files, I don't ever write it in this order here. I always start by writing the sampling distribution first. And then I look and see what the parameters are in that sampling distribution. And that tells me what I have to put a prior on. And then having done that, I'll generally go ahead and think about um, what derived quantities I'm interested in. So actually, 
even though I write them in my file in the order 1, 2, 3, I actually specify them in the order 2, 1, 3 because the, the parameters arise naturally in the specification of the sampling distribution. You'll notice that the for loop syntax is identical to that in R. That was on purpose. And so I say for i in 1 to n, 1 colon n, 1 to n. Um, and I use the bracket notation for indexing a vector. That's exactly the same as in R. So y of i, y bracket i bracket, is a draw from the T distribution. So all the densities in, in Winbug start with the letter D and then are followed by things like norm for normal and gamma and unif for uniform and T for T and so on. So I say Y of I is a draw from a T distribution with parameters mu and tau and nu. And the way I knew that was I went to the help function and read the user manual. And here's the user manual. And the user manual says there's a section called uh, distributions. And so you click on distributions, and it shows you all the distributions that it knows about built in. Any sampling distribution of interest to you, if it's not on this list, can be programmed in WinBugs, any sampling distribution. And so there's a trick that we, I can show you later on that you can bring in some exotic sampling distribution that's different from what they've got here, and no problem. Um, here I, want, I don't want a discrete univariate. I want a continuous univariate. So let's go along. It knows about beta and chi-squared and double exponential, and exponential, and gamma, and generalized gamma, and log normal, and logistic, and normal, and Pareto, and there we are, student T. And then also later on, uniform and Weibull. Um, and so here's the, uh, it tells you what the syntax is, and it shows you the density function, and it reminds you of the limits on, on, the, on the inputs. Um, and so, in fact, um, the thing that corresponds to degrees of freedom, it, from the expression I showed you before, here is called k, and it represents the third element in the vector of arguments you give uh, to the uh, uh, density operator dt. That's going to correspond to my degrees of freedom nu and u. Uh, and mu, obviously, is mu. But here you see that tau thing happening again, and that's because in WinBugs, they regard the t distribution as related to the normal distribution in the way I showed you. It's a scale mixture of normals. And so anything to do with normal distributions, they always specify spread in terms of the precision. and so. I can't actually write down that, um, that yi is a draw from the t distribution with, directly anyway with, the, with location mu and variance sigma squared and um, degrees of freedom nu because it won't let me put in the, the, the variance right there or the standard deviation. I have to put in the precision. And so um, that means right away that if I'm interested in the standard deviation, I have to put a line down here in the derived quantities that tells WinBugs what the standard deviation is in terms of the precision. And of course, if tau is 1 over the variance, then sigma must be 1 over the square root of tau. And so I use the obvious notation. They have the same assignment operator in WinBugs that they do in R. So I say sigma is assigned the value 1.0 divided by square root of tau. Square root is a built-in function in, in uh, WinBugs. Um, this makes sigma um, uh, related deterministically to the stochastic node tau. So sigma is, is stochastic in this model, but it has a deterministic relation to the, to the node tau. Um, I, will, I could, if I wanted to, put a prior on sigma instead, as long as I told WinBugs how these things are related to each other. But in this problem, I've chosen to put a prior on mu and tau and nu together. OK, so I can get rid of that. And this, uh, and we're back to my model. Now, the parameter vector theta here is really a vector, and it consists of the three components, mu and tau and nu. And that's a, that's a three-dimensional prior. I should really be prepared to put a three-dimensional prior on those quantities. Um, here is one thing that you might regard in terms of generality as a potential weakness in WinBugs. With rare exceptions, it does not allow you to specify multivariate priors. It forces you to specify the priors univariately and marginally, which is a way of you saying in the prior that you think your information about these quantities is independent of each other. And that sometimes does not describe what you actually know, but um, too bad for you if you're going to use WinBugs, because this is the only thing they know how to do. Um, and in general, it won't generally be, especially if you're building diffuse priors, it will generally not be any kind of restriction at all because whatever dependence ought to be there amongst those parameters in the posterior will be learned from the data in the likelihood function. So I'm OK with this restriction. It does, it, I've never found that it kept me from, from building a model that, that, that was scientifically useful. And so now here, 
in three separate lines, I specify the prior I showed you before. I have this marginal prior on mu I showed you before, and this marginal prior on tau, and this marginal prior on nu. And then finally, at the end, the last derived quantity that I work out is something I'll tell you about after our final break today. Uh, it's a way to construct draws, automatic draws from the predictive distribution of future data, which is a cool thing so that you don't have to evaluate um, uh, that any integrals in, in that I either. And then the last in input ingredient is you have to start the Markov chain somewhere. And that means that it wants you to tell it starting values for all of the things that are in the prior distribution. And so I, can, I could have started things off at generic starting values. I could have started mu off at 0 and tau off at 1 because it's a positive number and nu off at 100 or something like that. But why not get things started a little bit faster by putting in values that are sort of like what I expect to get in the posterior distribution. And I've already done those calculations to show you um, where the likelihood should be concentrated for mu and for tau. And then I just stuck in 5 as a number somewhere between 2 and 12. So this, that's the specification of everything in this model, except I haven't told you about the, the predictive distribution. We'll take our final break, start again at 4. And when we get back, I'll tell you about the predictive and various other things. So video guys, you can turn the, the uh, video off for the next 15 minutes. We'll start again right at uh, 4 o'clock. <laughs>